This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Get the little ones, sit back, relax, and listen to the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated G for general audiences. Big Spanderson versus the Universe! An all new out of this world adventure, written and read by Craig Taylor, with additional voices by Clarissa de Nederland and Tessa Taylor, and Maxwell Taylor as Big Spanderson. Chapter 1 A normal person would have been surprised when the alien spaceship landed. Almost anyone on Earth would have been terrified by the sleek, hawk-like shape, the dull hum of the engines as it lowered to the ground, retro rockets burning the forest clearing to a crisp beneath it. A normal person would have run, waving their arms above their head and gibbering madly. Bixby Joshua Anderson, Ranger Scout 2nd Class, was not a normal person. Some brave but foolhardy souls would have overcome their natural fear of the unknown and drawn closer, instead of running shrieking through the woods back to the relative safety of the Ranger Scout camp. However, even most of these courageous few would have remembered something else they were supposed to be doing very, very far away from there when the boarding ramp lowered and an actual alien landing force stomped down to the forest floor. Bixby Anderson just found himself wondering what had kept them so long. It isn't that he was particularly brave, or naturally courageous, not that he knew of at any rate. To be certain that you are brave, a person needs to be confronted with actual danger on a regular basis, and Bixby Anderson had never encountered much worse than the casual death defiance of crossing the street. He had lived a regular life, at a regular school, in a regular town, surrounded by regular people, knowing in his heart the entire time that he was not one of them and he never would be. He was built for adventure. He felt it in his bones. His parents, who meant well, thought that perhaps spending the summer of his eleventh year at Ranger Scout Camp would scratch their eldest child's itch for thrills and excitement. That alone was proof that neither Mr. nor Mrs. Anderson had ever been to Ranger Scout Camp, which was like boredom on steroids. The most exciting thing that had happened all summer was a long hike followed by hours and hours of quiet bird-watching, and it had happened every single day for almost a month. The Ranger Scout motto was, The truth will set you free, but Bixby was pretty sure that a big old spaceship could do the job much more thoroughly. No, the alien spaceship did not frighten Bixby Anderson when it arrived. It had frightened him every moment before that, wondering if it would ever show up. If the greatness that he knew deep inside he was meant for would ever have a chance to show itself, and now... Here he was, ready to meet an alien race on behalf of all mankind. As the heavily booted feet marched down the gangplank, Bixby smoothed his neckerchief, checked his many wilderness survival badges that he had earned for such thrilling exploits as campfire safety and cleaning up after yourself, and prepared to make first contact on behalf of a deeply, eternally grateful human species. Bixby smoothed his hair a little. They would name schools after him, and streets along which there would be Anderson Day parades in which he would ride himself, waving casually to the excited crowds, smiling modestly as if what he had done was actually no big deal. Bixby smiled and nodded to himself, preparing to emerge from the shrub in which he had been hiding since the ship roared out of the upper atmosphere. This was going to be awesome. The aliens stomped down to the planet's surface. There were two of them, and they were shaped like humans in that they had two arms and two legs, though their arms seemed to be very long, and their legs were stumpy and thick. Bixby could not tell if what they were wearing was armor or spacesuits or some combination thereof, but they were gleaming white, and each carried a heavy piece of equipment before him which he waved in a slow sweep of the area around the gangplank. Bixby thought they might be taking readings of 
background radiation or atmospheric content or any of the other things you might wish to know about an alien planet before you took a helmet off. Then there was, from the opposite direction, a loud snapping sound, like a tree branch had broken, or a deer had done something deer-like. Bixby had to admit he hadn't been very interested in the doings of the local fauna while at camp, so he couldn't really imagine what that might be. The point is, it was a sudden noise from the opposite direction, to which his new best friends from an alien planet responded by quickly and dramatically pointing their heavy equipment in such a way that left no doubt they were actually carrying guns. Enormous, dangerous-looking space guns. Bixby decided to wait in the shrub a little longer. That Anderson Day Parade sounded less fun if the car was carrying a shoebox full of his charred ashes. There were no further snapping noises from the forest, and the aliens relaxed, or at least did not open fire, which Bixby had to admit would have been cool, in a terrifying way. One of the helmeted beings looked at the other and said something that sounded like complete gibberish. Bixby frowned. This was a problem. In the movies, when the spacemen came to Earth, they always spoke English. It was going to be hard for him to establish peaceful relations with an alien species in the hour before he was supposed to be back at camp if he didn't speak their language. He frowned and looked at his watch. He decided that he didn't have to take the Ranger Scout schedule all that seriously. Nick Mendelssohn had once been 36 hours late and Ranger Dan had never noticed. And there had been a skinny kid in the first week of camp who said he would get home or die trying before he vanished into the woods. No one was sure which of the two options had actually happened, but Bixby knew the cabin was still splitting the kids' desserts. He had some time to work with. He would just step out, nice and slow, with his hands in the air, and greet these travelers on behalf of the entire human species. One of the aliens turned back to the ship and shouted something unintelligible, and Bixby ducked a little lower. He was disappointed in himself. This was his moment. There was no turning back. He couldn't just snap a photo and run away. His camera was in his phone, and that was in the lockup back at the Ranger Scout camp, along with every other piece of technology more sophisticated than two sticks rubbed together. He had discovered something amazing, and it was time to stop hiding in a shrub and do something about it. A small door buzzed open in the side of the ship, and a robot rolled out into the gangplank. The alien shouted another order, and the robot buzzed and chirped in response. Bixby was awestruck. He had always wanted to meet a robot, a real robot, not a toy or a prop or something boring from a STEM class, but a cool machine like this one. It was low and squat, with four fat wheels that rolled quickly down the gangplank. It had a long neck, and its head was shaped like a fancy pair of binoculars. It was all eyes, and they turned rapidly and craned every which way. Bixby took a long, astonished breath and moved a little closer. The robot came to a sudden, shuddering halt, and his head spun in Bixby's direction. The boy threw himself on the forest floor and kept completely still. He could hear the whirring of the robot's eyes, changing settings and lenses searching for him, but after a moment the sound stopped, and Bixby wondered if it was safe to look. The alien shouted something more at the robot, both of them speaking at the same time and sounding very annoyed. The robot made a small buzzing noise that sounded like it was muttering to itself, and it began to roll down the gangplank again. Bixby lifted his head from the dirt, careful to keep the lower branches of the shrub between himself and the strange visitor. The robot started to follow the aliens, heading off to the left, but it almost immediately broke off and moved back toward the right side of the ship, which happened to be the side that Bixby was currently cowering on. The robot's wheels folded up, and a series of insect-like legs folded out of its side so it could scutter easily across the uneven forest floor. Bixby ducked his head again and tried to look as much like a rock as he could. He felt he was pretty successful for a moment, and then began to worry the robot might be planning on taking some mineral samples, and if that was the case, a rock was perhaps not the thing to be posing as after all. There didn't seem to be much he could do about this, as he doubted he could pass for a flower, so he just kept still. The robot came to a halt within a few feet of Bixby, and the boy held his breath. He could hear the whizzing and buzzing again, followed by some rapid clicks, as if the machine were preparing some sinister device. Bixby began to wish he had not started holding his breath quite so early, as he didn't think he could keep it up much longer. From somewhere that seemed far away, the alien shouted again, sounding very angry now. The robot sputtered quietly and completed whatever work it was doing. It turned its head 180 degrees and prepared to scutter away back in the direction of the ship. 
Bixby peeked up and saw the robot holding a device in its pincers almost carelessly. It said something that sounded for all the world like, Oops! And let the device clatter to the forest floor, inches away from Bixby, and immediately crawled away quickly like a strange metal beetle. Bixby watched it go, astonished. That couldn't possibly have been an accident. The robot must have intended to drop that gizmo that was now laying in the undergrowth by Bixby's head, which meant the robot had to know that he was there, which meant the robot had not been planning on killing him at all. Didn't it? Bixby shifted to get a good look at the alien device. It looked like a set of earmuffs or headphones. There were a lot of electronics built into the part that went over your head, but it was unmistakably something you wore over your ears. Was Bixby supposed to put it on? What would happen? Maybe they would put his brain into suspended animation and he would be forced to live as the zombified slave of the aliens. That seemed likely. Except that it was probably the most roundabout way to capture a human that Bixby could imagine. If the robot wanted to subdue him, it could have zapped him or called the two hand-cannon-carrying alien soldiers, if that's what they were. Bixby pecked up the device. There were a lot of switches and toggles and... Bixby almost started flicking them on and off, but managed to stop himself in time. Whatever the robot was trying to do, it had put the device on a particular setting, which had made a small light in the display blink a steady green. Bixby wondered if green lights were universal. This one sure seemed to be. From the other side of the ship, he could hear the grunting and wheezing of the two aliens heading back this way. It seemed like it was now or never. He screwed up his eyes tight and slipped the headphones over his ears. "'There isn't any sense in moaning about it,' a voice said, clear as a bell. Bixby's eyes opened wide in amazement. What was happening? The aliens lumbered back into sight, their guns back in their holsters, each carrying a long metal pole with some equipment at the base. "'I don't see why you always have to be like this,' a different voice said. "'It was only a suggestion.' "'It's against regulations,' the first voice replied. "'You know better than this. You're as bad as that stupid robot.' Bixby realized with a start that the headphones were translating for him. The words he was hearing were exactly what the aliens were saying. He could understand them, and that meant that even if they could not understand him, they had technology that would allow them to do so. The parade was back on. Bixby Anderson was about to make first contact. Look, the second alien said, stomping after the first one. It isn't that I don't want to occupy this planet, all hail the universe. It isn't that at all. Bixby froze again. He did not like the sound of that. "'It's just you'd rather take a bit of a holiday first. the first alien snorted. "'It's eight days' flight to the transmission station,' number two protested. "'We haven't had a proper rest period in ages. "'We're a half-day from Seti Seti Seven, all hail the universe. "'Why don't we?' "'You did it again,' number one said crossly. "'You only all hail the universe when you're trying to whiffle past the rules.' "'Oh, I never did,' number two said, pointing his finger to emphasize his protest. "'You just find fault with everything I do.' I find fault with treason, yes, all hail the universe. You only all hail the universe to make me look bad. You do a pretty good job of that yourself, mate, all hail the universe. All hail the universe, the second voice said emphatically. All I'm saying is the orbital stations have been collecting data on this rock for 400 years. What does it matter if we upload the data right away? What's another week or two? Section 9,472, subsection Alpha Alpha 11, paragraph 9,605, the first voice began officiously. Don't you quote the manual to me, you overweight gas bag. When a Class 6 planet has met all the necessary requirements for admission, the process for occupation and colonization shall proceed without delay, in order that its resources may better serve the universe. All hail the universe. All hail the universe, the second voice whimpered sadly. Without... Delay, the first voice emphasized. Yes, the second voice said petulantly. All hail the universe. All hail the universe. Bixby began to wonder if the translator was slightly broken or if these two simply did not know what the word universe meant. Don't pout, the first voice said. You're ridiculous when you pout. I'm not ridiculous, you're ridiculous, the second voice said, but he was pouting and it did make him sound fairly ridiculous. Look. As soon as we get these beacons planted, we'll get off this rock. We've got two more stops to make in this sector, then we break for the transmitter. Once we upload the data packs, the universe can send an occupying army to... The alien paused to check the clip screen. To Earth. Then you and I can rotate out for a period. Get a proper holiday on Freighton 4. The second alien sniffed. Freighton 4? You promise? 
All hail the universe, the first alien said, crossing a spot on his torso where his heart might very well be. Two weeks at the most, maybe ten days. Come on, the sooner we finish up the better. The two aliens carried their burden away from the ship and out of Bixby's sight. Bixby was frozen for a moment. It suddenly seemed less likely that anyone would throw a parade over this discovery. <laughs> the Earth was due to be occupied by an alien invasion force. <laughs> as soon as these two goons reached their transmission station, their masters would know that Earth was ripe for the plucking. If the transmission were actually sent, that is. Bixby looked around for any kind of weapon for a moment, then dismissed that as ridiculous. What good would a stick or a pocket knife be against giant space guns? Bixby looked at the ship, gleaming in the afternoon sunlight. Maybe there were more guns on board. He began to creep quickly and quietly toward the gangplank. He could hear the two aliens coming back already. If he let them get away, there would be nothing that could stop the invasion of the Earth. He didn't know how to stop them now, but he could understand them. He could figure something out. The voices behind him were still bickering, and they were getting closer. He ran up the gangplank and into the cool darkness of the alien spaceship beyond. And six minutes and forty-two seconds later... Bixby Joshua Anderson, Ranger Scout Second Class, became the first human to fly beyond the moon. He wondered if anyone would ever know about it. Hello, I'm John Bell of Bells in the Battery, along with my associates, Arnie Kunchbein. I can introduce myself. Thank you very much. All right. Hi, I'm Arnie Kunchbein. That's it. That's it. And also... Do you want me to introduce you, Brad? Well, of course, Mr. Bell. That's your job as host. Thank you, Brad. And I'd like to introduce Brad... Hold it. What? Here's your script. Script? <laughs> well, you got to know what to say. All right. <clears throat> and introducing Brad Montworth, a salesman, incomparable public relations expert, and, of course, unrivaled attorney at law. No, come on. You know how to say it, Mr. Bell. Unrivaled attorney, attorney at, at, at law. 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 Oh, Mr. Bell, you shouldn't say those things. You make me blush. Can I do my introduction over again? No. We're here for an important reason. Very important. Indeed. If you think you deserve significant financial compensation, call Brad Motworth, attorney, attorney at, at law. law. Oh, boy. At 5554. No, 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 no. We're here to remind everybody to take steps to avoid the coronavirus. Yeah, don't catch it. Because there's no one you can sue. Wash your hands thoroughly and keep social distancing. What? Social distancing. One more time. Stay about six feet away from everybody else. Right, very good. Oh, I gotta wash my hands thoroughly. I don't want to get me this corona. Ooh, keep your distance now. Socially. I want to keep feeling fine. Corona. Never gonna stop getting squirts from my Purell. I'm always gonna buy all the toilet paper that they sell. Bye, 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 bye. 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 Whoa. Bye, 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 Corona. Bye, Corona. Don't get no closer, huh? Beat it, huh? Far enough where I can't see your eyes, Corona. An illness history is not for me. Uh-uh. Don't want to try your COVID on for size, Corona. Never gonna touch. Stay away. My epidermis never wants to be close to where that nasty germ is. Bye, 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 bye. Woo! Bye, Corona. Fly, Corona. Captain Fly, Corona. What? Pumpkin pie, Corona. Now wait a minute. Fly, Corona. Goodbye, Corona. Good riddance.